two, please, because um, again in the Argyll report we say uh, in the last um, in the report in 2012 identified only four applicants defining themselves as gypsy travellers. Now I absolutely support the right of anyone to self-define. Do you think that's giving an accurate reflection of perhaps the movement from sites to houses, for want of a better phrase, and why do you think people would want to move from sites to houses? Because my understanding is some don't. Exactly. Um, personally, I suspect those statistics are quite low. I can only give a personal opinion on that. You can't. I, I can't say that definitely. I, I believe there is an element of self-identification where folks don't necessarily want to define themselves as a traveller. Um, and in terms of the drift towards houses, I think that's very much, it's an individual's choice, isn't it? It may be for all sorts of reasons. It could be for education facilities. It could be because there's illness in the family that they find that they do have to come off the road. Some older travellers, people settle in houses when they're older because of health issues, wanting to link into medical services. There are a myriad of reasons why folk may settle in houses. Um, and I don't think you can really, in any circumstance, have a one-size-fits-all for people. Can I ask all three, uh, please, give me that then. Um, if someone who does identify as a gypsy traveller elects to move, and, and, I, and I fear the gypsy traveller community are surveyed out, to be perfectly honest, um, and this committee is probably compounding things in a way, <laughs> but we're, we're, it's, it's well intended. Is there any inquiry done as to why that may be the case? Because again, the linkage between voids and taking occupancy of, because I'm sure all your authorities will have a lot of demand for, for houses as well. Um, has there been any examination done of that in any of your authorities, please? There's no empirical evidence that I'm aware of, and there certainly isn't. It's been uh, engaged in locally, um, other than uh, as Ms. McPhail is indicating that um, at individual household preference uh, for moving from um, uh, a travelling lifestyle to, to one of uh, much more settled and permanent um, within the settled communities. Um, so the short answer is no, I'm afraid, but it is in terms of self-identification and self-disclosure on uh, through the allocation process about why somebody is seeking housing, uh, and certainly from the cases that we're aware of, and as I say, they've been uh, three in the last three years in, in my local authority, uh, it's been precisely those reasons. It's education, it's older people within uh, the family unit, um, we're having to look to take account of that in terms of health and social care integration. Um, there's inevitably going to be some impact in terms of the welfare reform provisions that are, that are due to, to take uh, place. Um, so there may be consequences from that, but in terms of a definite answer, no, I'm afraid we do not have one. Yeah, I think we, would, we need to do more research on this issue as well. We recognise that there, that there could be a benefit in so doing, particularly with a greater partnership working, if one of them was about health provision, mm. maybe education is slightly different and more challenging. But because location of sites, again, <coughs> is something that we've had representations made about and accessibility to facilities. Because to be perfectly honest, while some of them may be in traditional sites, the idea of putting someone in a, a rubbish uh, site, as happens in my own area in Inverness, quarry, which happens in my own area in the Highlands, a sandpit, another sandpit in Argyle, it, they're not the most alluring of locations and there may be a number of reasons why that is the case. So that sort of examination, if you had people wanting to leave an area of housing, I'm sure, if you want to uh, establish what could be done to retain people at that location. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Uh, that would be the, the position uh, in terms of the analogy you've given with void properties uh, and that's where we've had locally uh, with Eastern Midlothian, that engagement with the, the community uh, on, on our established site and identified their priorities in terms of the upgrade provision as well as the prospect of relocation when that featured, um, as, as I keep uh, referencing, the, the fact that it, uh, uh, it's a leased uh, site that uh, we currently have our um, provision located on. 
Um, but certainly, to, to pick up your point, and indeed it's, it's where we came in on in terms of planning of the provision for um, health and uh, other opportunities and education, uh, that yes, we need that information to make sure that the suitable provision. Uh, we have health arrangements um, at the site. Um, it's on the basis that we have to take the, the services to the site rather than expect on every occasion uh, that the uh, Gypsy Travels are going to engage with those which are on fixed sites within um, the settled communities. Um, but in order to accommodate that, uh, of course, we need that uh, engagement with the, the community itself. I think that's quite an interesting point. I think that that's something that we could actually report on annually relatively easily. We are in constant contact with our travellers. Um, we, uh, the site, um, very small numbers moving on over the course of a year, and we certainly could uh, report on that annually. And I think um, that might be something that our board might want us to incorporate into our annual information that goes to them. So I'll certainly look at taking that forward in a, in a gale. Can I ask what the cost of our tenancy changes for each of your authorities, please? Someone, someone taking occupancy in a, 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 a house, is there a cost associated with that? In terms of a, a void property... A void property that's subsequently been occupied. Relet, yeah. I mean, that can range... Um, from really a minimum from £500 roughly to up to £3,000, depending on the condition of the property that's returned uh, for relate uh, to us. So the of, of, of the standing and, and the sites is, is, is a thing I've come across mm -hmm. both in the course of this and, and previously. And it would seem to me you can buy an awful lot of Tar Macadam for that. Again, you know, any cost-benefits analysis of, of facilitating someone staying where they may want to stay um, and addressing their concerns, because some of the facilities are quite frankly shocking, you know. Can you speak point? Certainly our site in, in Elyden is actually very attractive, and I think it's down to the management of the, of the site, and certainly it's, it seems to be well, it's well occupied. Um, we're still we're reviewing the management agreement at the moment in terms of making it more needs focused, but certainly the management has been good, and I think a lot of it's to do with you know, the sensitivity in terms of the management and how that's approached. It shouldn't be down to the, the goodwill of, of individuals, which is commendable. Yeah. Uh, and it shouldn't be beyond the wit of the public sector to provide facilities like that. That, too, after all, is where the statutory obligation rests. So, but there, there are ways and means, you know, if something's working well, and certainly the approach we have, we, we, we're working with the Scottish Sites Management, Management Group, and we've had very good reports back in terms of how things are managed, and I think we've got to look at being innovative and looking at what, what possibilities are, particularly in the financial situation we're in. Okay, thanks very so, much indeed. Um, Dennis Robertson has a supplementary yeah, on just, that. Just on this very point, um, you know, we're hearing, uh, it's very commendable, uh, some of the things we're hearing today um, about surveying and engagement, etc. Um, in the North East, uh, Murray, Aberdeenshire and Aberdeen City came together and collaborated with one another, the three authorities, to identify um, what the needs were for the gypsy travelling community. And they came up with a programme and identified and had a, a plan, etc., to say that they require, they require the gypsy travelling require 35 sites. Um, from that, they have one site. Now, what I'm hearing is um, we can identify and we can survey, but what about action? What about actually provide the provision, the end result? Because it's fine to identify, and it's fine to say that we've identified what is required, but are you taking the appropriate actions? Yes. To some extent, in different organisations, that rests on strategic leadership. Um, in my own association, and I'm, I suppose, talking about managing sites rather than introducing new sites or transit sites, um, there is quite clear strategic leadership on travellers' issues. We have a strategy in place, an annual survey, an annual action plan, which goes to our board of management, and then we will be reporting on actions required. And in fact, the action plan includes the survey results. It includes one of our uh, traveller sites now as a residence group set up, which is great. We have a list of their uh, requirements, which are very specific um, estates issues. Uh, we have some strategic issues. Um, and some liaison and joint work with the council and other service providers locally. So I do believe that in terms of strategic leadership to set priorities and to review progress on priorities is essential.
to the base services for travellers. The end result is that action will be taken then? That's right. Glad to hear it. Mr Scott, do you want to...? Well, um, I think from what I've said, the strategic leadership in terms of equalities is right at the heart of what we're trying to do in, in community planning. And Gypsy Travellers is very much part of that. And we have taken very, uh, we've taken a very strong approach to this in terms of evidence gathering. You're using the Equality Act to lead your housing well, policies. Well, but this way, it has an well, it, it, the Equality Act well, obviously has an influence in that. But obviously, we we'll see equality as <coughs> best practice anyway, because it, obviously we, we, we need to ensure we've, we've got an inclusive approach from a, a service delivery and best value uh, perspective. Um, we have we've got a guide uh, which we work we've worked on that is, is, and that's that's action. Uh, we're taking real action on the ground to make contact with the gypsy travellers. We're trying to gather the evidence. Um, we feel that the services we're providing through their education, health, etc., uh, are meeting the mark at the moment. We, 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 I think there's still room for improvement, and but I do think we have got a stronghold of the issue from a strategic point of view. Thank you. Thank you. Just to uh, supplement uh, what Mr Scott's saying, um, in terms of, I think, Mr Robertson's expectation is that the housing regulator now has uh, that expectation of local authorities when it's carrying out its inspection. And certainly that's been my experience in our most recent inspection, uh, that we were not, in, just in terms of the equalities aspect, uh, important though that is and underpinning a lot of the progress that's been made indeed. Uh, but for the specific client groups that we've referenced, um, being mainstreamed, for want of a better term, uh, th there is that expectation that whilst it's indeed best practice, uh, and we've moved on considerably, um, but there's, a, there's the compulsion from the regulator is most certainly making that happen. Thanks for that. Dennis, would you want to come back in? Thank you. Thank you. I'll move on now to Marco Biagi with questions around leadership, and then I'll bring in Siobhan McMahon, who wanted to discuss tenancy agreements with the witnesses. Marco. I think we've already had an introduction to the question of leadership. So can I just ask, in your experience, do you think that community groups and civic representatives in the vicinity of permanent sites see gypsy travellers on those sites as part of the community or somehow external? My experience of our sites, which are very, very uh, established, um, I believe that our travellers are seen as part of the community. They go to village, the children go to village schools, people attend local doctors. So I do believe that we are well integrated within the community. <coughs> Certainly, in terms of the Midlothian provision, um, yes, they, they are. Yeah. They, uh, there is that understanding. Um, they are integrated, as I indicated earlier, in terms of the health provision, the education provision in Midlothian. Um, and uh, say there's no distinction made in that regard uh, within the local settled communities. Um, but that is not always the case everywhere, and, and it was never thus. Um, certainly, I would imagine that, well, I take the same analogy of a house of multiple occupation, uh, or indeed in some of the uh, family resilience projects that have been taking place in uh, across the country, um, that obviously people would, their preference is not to have that facility, even though in terms of social responsibility and social attitudes, it is to benefit the wider community. Um, and they have, over time, proved their worth uh, in terms of family projects. Um, and the good HMOs are indistinguishable from uh, the, the general mainstream stock in any particular locality. So it's how this is managed, um, uh, which has improved, as we've referenced earlier, which has got us to the position uh, where it's um, seen to be in terms of the professionals and expectation that it's part of the day job. Um, but for the local communities, uh, it's how it's managed on site because it's real, it's there, uh, it's evident um, to them. And that's not just the housing or local authority responsibility, that's the community at large uh, and all the public agencies that are involved in delivering services to them. Um, with regard to the official site in the yeah, very, from the evidence we have, seems to be very well integrated into, into, into the, the community and certainly, you know, the use of schools, etc. that seems to be linked to that as well. Uh, with regard to, we have a St Bozzle's Fair each year, which is um, held in end of July. Uh, Gypsy Travellers are there officially on a site on the green, you can stay 68 for about five, six days. 
Again, there's integration there. We have a lot of community liaison with respect to that, but it does have its challenges as well in terms of the community. And with regard to unauthorised sites, obviously what we do is we do work with the communities with respect to that, but it's challenging with respect to, to that. Well, in terms of uh, communities being concerned about seeing encampments coming into particular locations, and we, we've, got, we've got to work with uh, the community and explain to the community, you know, the, the situation, and, um, and, and, and also work with the Egyptian travellers as well to try and ensure we have mediation and effective mediation between, between the two, but work within a tolerant environment. You've mentioned the difficulty with unauthorised encampments, and there's already the example from the northeast of a a study that had suggested the value of uh, a substantial increase in the number of uh, permanent or transit sites. If you were to, as uh, officials, uh, suggest uh, into the, the, the decision-making framework the possibility of an additional, for example, three or four sites to deal with the demand that has led to uh, unauthorised encampments or has contributed to the demand to uh, unauthorised encampments. How do you think uh, groups uh, and others would respond to that uh, external to the Council? Again, I would say I don't have any personal experience of this. Our sites date back for decades now um, and there is no attempt at the moment in Argyll to create additional sites. So I can't say with any validity how the communities would react to that. And as I say, um, our early site goes way back to the 1980s and went on to a site where travellers stopped. So I couldn't honestly determine how communities might react. I, th I think it's, it's challenging because obviously there is sensitivity. The difficulty we have is that, you know, we're talking about, certainly from the border's perspective, we're talking about short stays, you know, four to ten days or so. We're talking about issues about charging, you know, because at the moment, you know, obviously in a northern side it's free, you know, people. They, and I think that there are challenges there in, term, in terms of that. So um, I would say the jury's still out in terms of whether there is a need for transit sites or whether the approach we have in terms of a tolerance approach is, is, is what suits the Egyptian travelling community. I don't know. But certainly, if the evidence we have would suggest, you know, that the, 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 the tolerance approach we have seems to work. But I, I, and, I, and I still don't know whether, um, you know, that the, the, the putting forward transit sites would, would act, particularly from a financing point of view, would, would, would work that effectively. Certainly, sorry. Certainly, in terms um, of Midlothian, given that our site has only been at half capacity for four years. Um, um, and in terms of Mr Finney's earlier position, we do have visitor provision uh, on our pitches. Um, so that is certainly available. Uh, there isn't an evident need for it. As I say, we've had um, two occasions over two years, which would be indicative of uh, the, the um, travellers travelling through um, Midlothian, which is one of the, the smaller authorities in the country in any event. Uh, so it would be unlikely that there is a, a perceived need for uh, further site provision uh, in any case. It's, it's really improving what we've got there uh, because that's the, the feedback that we've had as opposed to the, the lack of provision. And, uh, but I would imagine in terms of the cultural awareness if, for those authorities who would have that issue, uh, it's certainly going through the process that um, we have to date and having that understanding that there is that social responsibility to provide for the community at large uh, and evidencing that, um, but it comes back to the, the nimbyism about particular sites um, and ensuring that they are for the best provision of the occupants as well as the uh, impact on the immediate community. And one issue, one suggestion that has been made to this committee on several occasions is a greater national framework or stronger national guidance as to provision. What would your views be on that? If, if there's, <laughs> Rush at once. Well, if there's an expectation to ensure that each local authority, as has been the case with homelessness, as has been the case with violence against women, these are issues which <coughs> We're always there, but their profile has become much more evident uh, and, and a need to tackle the difficulties uh, that are symptomatic of, of those uh, being evident in local communities. Um, but as I say, beyond the 
softer approach, which has been best practice, and it's taken as long as it has to get to this point, and, and if there's the expectation that uh, that's much more inherent in the service delivery of local authorities, uh, then yes, it would, it would have to be something which was uh, a statutory requirement that was enforced. And as I say, the regulator has certainly taken that approach in uh, the past uh, year or two. Um, so it's either done through that avenue, uh, if there isn't legislative provision to be uh, provided for it, that is the expectation um, that we're delivered, and that's what we would be uh, measured on. Uh, with uh, the existing regulator or anything that replaced it. Yeah, I think if the statutory guidance becomes available, I, th I think that could be useful. I think it's certainly raised issues, as you've said, in terms of homelessness and uh, domestic violence, which has been successful. It's set an agenda which has been closely followed and, and results are clear for all to see. Um, so we would certainly support that and we would want to be clear that the, the aspirations of travellers were an integral part of setting any sort of statutory guidance. Uh, Mr Scott? I think there's a need for a national overview of you know, um, the gypsy travelling uh, uh, community and, and the movement with respect to that. Um, obviously, what happens will, in terms of a vision will depend on place to place, and I think we've got to be aware of the evidence approach. Um, I think, you know, in terms of statutory, I think we just got to be careful in the sense that, uh, you, you know, uh, especially the costs in, involved with respect to that. But I feel very strongly you've just got you've got to base things on evidence, and uh, if, if statutory provision needs to come from, if, uh, based on evidence, if statutory provision requ required, then statutory provision is required. But I think it's the, the evidence that we need to work on. But I do think we need a national approach to look at this and look at what's required from a national perspective, which is. <laughs> to understand the movements, etc. In terms of a national approach, is that the the strongest argument for it, the dealing with the cross-border yes, uh -huh. movements? Yeah, and I, I think also there's, there'll be a need to certainly maybe look at North of England as well, you know, look at the, these have links there as well, just to, just to understand what, what's happening in the community. Are there any other issues that are of a scale that individual local authorities find it difficult to deal with? There's one issue which isn't necessarily hugely difficult to deal with, but I think would benefit from a, a national overview, which is about the tenancy agreements and the types of tenancy agreements, but I think there may be later questions on that. Any questions, Thank you. I'll move on to Siobhan McMahon with questions around tenancy agreements, and then I have a couple of questions for um, the witnesses. Siobhan. Thank you. Um, apologies for not being with you at the start of today's meeting, firstly. Um, on tenancy agreements, you'll understand that the 2001 report from the Equal Opportunities Committee um, indicated that there should be a uniform tenancy agreement across Scotland. So what I was wondering is, what do you include in your own tenancy agreements at the moment and what criteria is applied to how that is drawn up? We have an occupancy agreement uh, which has been in place for many years uh, and I has succeeded to that occupancy agreement from the Council. Um, it is not as comprehensive as the leases, the SST and the SSST, which was the Scottish model, which um, is now in place across Scotland for mainstream tenancy. So we, as an association, see a priority for travellers as trying to move towards some sort of model tenancy agreement that would be in place. In terms of hours in particular, I think it will be like my colleagues, a seven-day notice period, which is something that travellers see as important so that they can go without being held to 28 days as it is in settled housing. Um, an opportunity for uh, travellers to travel, so it's up to eight weeks with us I, at half rent. The reality is I suspect my colleagues will have different things and that's why we would like to see a model tenancy agreement in place? Uh, certainly um, our situation isn't dissimilar uh, to, to the one indicated. We have what we term a secure occupancy agreement. That uh, mirrors a Scottish secure tenancy agreement. Um, we, can, we can't have a secure tenancy because it's not a site that either of the councils who operate this own. There are key exceptions with the right to buy and uh, assignation and right to repair, but other than that, it reflects the, uh, the Scottish secure tenancy in as far as it possibly can, um, but takes account of the particular circumstances, as uh, Ms McPhail has said, uh, in relation to the travelling community and uh, the period of time that the site uh, 
uh, the pitch would be vacated, uh, would be ex accepted and ex expected as well. From the, the, the Border's perspective, uh, I, mean, I, I mentioned that our, tr our official site is run by a, commercial, uh, 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 by a site manager commercially based. Basically, it's, it's well managed, it's, it's, it's done through custom and practice, it's well occupied. Uh, we are uh, currently, we actually are, are who are reviewing the management agreement in terms of a needs and looking at more of a needs based approach to that. So th that, that's where we are with the official site. Mr Anderson, you said a period of time it is indicating your own occupancy. What would that period of time be for? Sorry, I, I don't recall whether it was six, eight, or eight weeks. That's that's right, why okay. I'm on, I'm unsure, unclear on that particular point. But it is in the duration of six to eight weeks. I can't recall specifically it's six or eight weeks. Okay, thank you. And Ms McField, you said it wasn't as comprehensive as it could have been. What were the reasons for that? At the outset, obviously, you've indicated that you wished to go further, but what were the reasons that it wasn't comprehensive? We've inherited the lease um, for many of our long-standing tenants. We'll continue on the same lease assigned with the council. Uh, we would like to say it with colleagues in other councils, largely councils who are running um, sites, we would like to be part of a wider group that produces a model lease. We think um, there seems to be in different places different leases. That leads to confusion with travellers. It leads to confusion with folk travelling between different authorities, um, there can be low levels of literacy and we just think that one standard lease in whatever forum would be something that we should try as a nation to move forward on. I should say that though ours um, doesn't enshrine some rights uh, which our housing tenants get, we have actually moved forward in doing that. So the right to repair is available to our tenants and that's detailed in our strategy uh, so that they get exactly the same level of repair service and we have the same responsibilities to them as any other tenant in Argyll. And aids and adaptations, we get the same level of aids and adaptation services as tenants, so we've committed to doing that. did one of my, my questions, because um, what I was going to ask was, we visited a number of sites, and one in particular I visited, um, the caravan that the family were staying in um, was in desperate need of repair, um, and I think that's been polite about it, um, and I think if they'd been in any other housing, um, there would be an outcry about the living conditions. So what are the steps that that family can go through to get repairs? Because clearly, for me, I don't think there was enough information for the family. So if they required a repair to, to their caravan or the, the site, what, what, would go, what would be the process? Two elements to it. There's the, the pitch, the hard standing, and the, the pitch unit and the electricity supply, which is what the rent is paid for and which the provider repairs. The caravan is owned by the tenant and they would have to look at that. Now in my experience we have had some folk who either the caravan has through age become a uh, unsuitable to occupy or because of storms the folk have had damage. We have worked with travellers to find effectively funding to get repairs done or to get a new caravan. In a very small number of cases, a very small handful of cases where it's become a crisis situation, there's families involved, we've helped folk to secure temporary accommodation. And just for everyone then, do you think and understand why the caravan would be the responsibility of, of the people who occupy it, given that they may move around um, different sites and, and so you're not responsible for what happens in, in other sites? But given if they have lived there for a period of time, do you think that could be built in any tenancy agreement that um, it is the responsibility of whoever owns the site? Um, so, for instance, if the traveller has been there six months, that the council or the housing association can work with them on the repairs rather than it is their responsibility? It's an interesting thought which has never been raised before, um, right. certainly for travellers. They see the caravan as their property and something that they can trade and move up and, and improve on yeah. often. So I certainly have never come across that with travellers looking at that as something to do. Though I do understand that at Perth there are actually chalets on the, the site which is a wee bit different, a very different model and maybe something that could be explored there. And would you, but if the traveller was open <coughs> to it, would you be open to at least looking at that um, in a model tenancy agreement? If we were talking about national, and, and obviously please feel free to come in, it's not just Miss McPhail I'm asking of, um, but if you were putting it in a national model of tenancy, would that be something that, that you'd be open to looking at? If you'd look at it, it would be unusual to do repairs to tenants' rents pay for repairs. 
and it would be unusual to do repairs to something that the tenants' rents don't own. So it would be a slightly unusual circumstance. It would be quite interesting to see the wider tenants' group, how they felt about that, and the wider travelling group, how they felt about that. Move on from that question. Can I specifically ask you something, um, Miss McPhail? I visited um, the site at Loch Gilphead um, along with some other members of the, the, the committee, and I'm interested in the, the, the point you made about um, working with um, people on the site if there was a problem with their caravan. Um, could you explain to me exactly what you mean by working with? Well, again, there's actually a residence association we've managed to get started up now mm -hmm. with some of the tenants. They've given us a list of priorities for the site that they see, and we've put that into our action plan for the next year. And um, those were the access road, which is poor to the site, which is owned by the council, uh, trying to work on that to do some joint working with the council to improve the quality of that, and some other estates issues. With, if, if a caravan's in, in disrepair or in a very poor state, you don't work with the tenants on provision of a new caravan? We don't provide funds for caravans, no. No, that's, that's fine. Thank you for clarifying that, Siobhan. And then just on maybe a follow-up to that then, um, and again, please, I'm, I'm not trying to direct every question to Ms McPhail, but you mentioned aids and adaptations. What would the process be then to, to help if, if you were going to look at that, and given that then you don't own the caravan? How does that work? Uh, in ACAF, what we do is, for any tenant, uh, up to an adaptation of £200, we just do it without uh, going to the occupational therapist or the grant system. So that's handrails and things. So we've done some of that. Handrails, I mean, 80 units. We can put handrails onto a caravan if, some, if that would help somebody. Um, for bigger adaptations, which are grant-funded uh, through the, the government, and that's usually sort of ramps, to caravan doors and things where folk are becoming less mobile for getting in and out. Uh, we've had grant to do them through the aids and adaptation system that's available to citizens of the country. And in one instance, a, a, a caravan unit was purchased to provide very disabled facilities. Through yourself? Through the council. The, the, council. <coughs> right, okay. the council did that and it's on our pitch. But that was a very unusual case. Generally, we, ramps, handrails are done through the yeah. general aids and adaptation. Adaptation system. Is that your chef, Just to confirm, yes. I mean, um, our process has been the same as outlined by Ms. McPhail. That's why I wasn't disagreeing or ad <laughs> countering what she was saying. It's the same position where we've made uh, adaptations to the amenity block, which is uh, uh, adjacent to each of the, the pitches there. Uh, we haven't gone to the extent or required to. We haven't had the circumstances that Ms. McPhail's encountered of. Uh, providing a, a, a specialist to provide a caravan, but we, we do the adaptations as they've proved necessary on the site, yes. In the borders, we have one unit uh, that is adapted for disability needs. Uh, so, and, and, that's, uh, and, and that's got its full access ramps and everything else. John Finney wanted to come in on a supplementary before I come back to you, John. Yeah, it is for Ms McPhail, and I'm conscious we want to address individual circumstances. As I said, I am going to ask about a particular circumstance uh, in your area where on one of your um, sites there is a chalet that was put in place to uh, address very specific and profound needs of, of one of the occupants, and uh, there was good collaborative working in relation to that. I think there's a way to go yet, but... Um, Yet the council retains ownership of that, Shirley. How does that come about? Um, the aids and adaptations funding, the grant funding from the government came to the council to provide the chalet and we provided the pitch. I should say that that's the second chalet of that type to meet the needs. Um, so that was actually a replacement as the needs grew greater for a previous one. However, it is accommodation. It's it's accommodation and a rent's paid for it, but it's paid to the council. Right. That's a quite unusual anomaly. It's a very unusual anomaly. It's a very unusual case. Right. So if, if there were to be other instances like that, and hopefully there wouldn't, but uh, I mean the likelihood is that there could well be... You could have a situation where um, one of your sites, there's property owned by the council, it's property owned by the tenants and your overall responsibility for all of it. 
well, but, obviously not the, the, the tenant's yeah. property. But. but it's always been the case that um, travellers have brought their own accommodation to the site and we manage the amenity unit. That one is slightly unusual because they pay rent for it. Um, but as I say, it's a replacement for one that went on before. Is that something you would wish to see captured in some sort of, sort of national tenancy agreement, specifically how aids and adaptations are dealt with? It would be useful if there were some clarity on it, yes. OK, thank you very much indeed. Finally, um, then, we've established that a national tenancy agreement would be beneficial. Um, but, Ms McPhail, you, you mentioned that there are three sites I are involved in and own. Um, at the moment, then, are the occupancy agreements that you mentioned, are they all the same or are they different? They're all the same. OK, thanks very much. ACA also has to get a caravan site licence because we're an RSL and not a council operating traveller sites, um, which can be quite interesting and would have to be fed into any work that was done, being done on a national model agreement um, because the uh, caravan site licence will often detail how many caravans you're allowed to have on a pitch and that has to be taken into account in terms of the occupancy agreement which may well also say that as well they can be and uh, they can contradict each other but councils don't have to get caravan site licenses so associations. Mm -hmm. so we would need to, uh, we're the only housing association with the site so i think we would need to feed into that if we we're able to move forward on that agenda thanks for sharing that Okay, thanks. Um, can, can I ask the, the witnesses if they have in their authorities, and again, Ms McPhail, um, if they have a gypsy traveller liaison officer in situ, and if they do, what value do they attach to the role, and how do they see that role developing to improve relations with the settled community? That one. Um, basically, I think it's horses for courses. And uh, basically, it depends really on, on the need in each area. Certainly, we take a community planning approach to, to this. We have a, a, we, we have a liaison person. Just that person just happens to be our chair of the Borders Equality Forum, who's got a lot of experience in dealing with different equality groups. Mm -hmm. And basically, he is able to provide a very sensitive approach to welcoming gypsy travellers to our area through, uh, with regard to the various encampments I've spoken about. So um, we feel, from our perspective, the approach we're taking, we don't have a, a person who's actually employed by the council, but we have, we pay for a liaison person who, who operates for the council, but also acts for the health board as well, who, who asks questions on behalf of health, and has the trust of the police and others, uh, and he has the trust of the community as well, and that we feel that works well from the borders. Yes, we have, uh, in addition to the site manager liaison, uh, which is contracted through Shelter, Mary Craig, who I think has given evidence in, in her own right previously. So uh, certainly she undertakes the same uh, liaison uh, process with um, the statutory services, health um, and the local communities and education um, requirements in terms of the, the site occupants. And the feedback both from herself and indeed the, the uh, Gypsy Travellers is... Uh, uh, very positive and commendable from uh, the situation where we didn't have that liaison arrangement before uh, and certainly she's facilitated awareness raising sessions in the past year for uh, officers, members uh, and, and other uh, service providers uh, and everybody has found that extremely beneficial. Ms McPhail, the Housing Association, do you have a Gypsy Traveller liaison officer? We don't have, we have a officers who uh, cover the traveller site within the village and serves the tenants within the, the wider village community but there is a more direct uh, contact with travellers than the village we actually we go once a week to the sites um, and there's three different officers dealing with it um, interesting that in our survey one of the things that came out really well uh, was that travellers the majority of travellers felt that the, the amount that we visited the site was right and that the ways in which they can get in touch with us there's an 0800 free phone number uh, was good 100 percent of respondents said that mm -hmm. so we don't have a liaison officer but from the work that we've done we think that the way we are dealing directly on a case-led basis with folk is working um as i said it's it's a traveler work is is embedded within our strategic direction um, the council doesn't have a liaison officer, so we do work with the local housing strategy folks. 
Mr Anderson, you, you mentioned the um, awareness raising that um, Fadi Craig does, and as you say, she has come in and given us evidence. Um, and I wonder, do Mr Scott and Ms McPhail see a value in doing awareness raising with the local community? Not so much with other um, partners, but actually the local community to improve relationships with the gypsy travellers in the settled community. I think it's fundamental, and certainly with the St Basil's Fair, uh, we've we've got a community liaison. Uh, we have established a community liaison with with the local community, and there is a it is a challenge in, in terms of working through that, but. Uh, I feel with the person we have who is operating as our liaison person working with us, uh, certainly when we, we go through things with the community, I think it's a much easier process. Um, obviously, when we, with, with regards to some of the unauthorised encampments, we do have our difficulties at times. But again, uh, you know, uh, we, we try and get our mediation process going and we try and make the community aware of, of what, what, you know, what, what our responsibilities are and also look at the equalities issues as well. And, but we are pushing very heavily equalities into our communities. Ms McPhail? Yeah, we've previously carried out a uh, liaison work with colleagues and service users, which travellers have taken the lead in, and they've, they've done the work and uh, explained to folks. I think that's a good point about extending that into the wider community. I think that's a really good point and something I can take home. Mr Scott, if I could just come, ba come back to you and follow up on that point. When you spoke earlier about the, uh, the private site that you have, mm -hmm. that, that travellers, gypsy travellers use, could you perhaps give us a bit more information about the relationship that the gypsy travellers have with the other site users? And if having gypsy travellers on, if you like, a proper caravan site has actually improve the relationship that the, the travellers have with the local community? Well, you know, you might find out this amazing, but I, we, I haven't really come across any really difficulties. You know, you'd thought that there may be stresses, but from the information we have and from talking to the site managers, etc., there doesn't seem to be a lot of friction between the Gypsy Travelling Committee and the, and the rest of the people on the commercial site. And also, as well, you know, it's in, in Elysian, we're doing a lot of work in mountain biking, and, and a lot, a lot, it's a, a great tourist area. And really, we've not had the friction with the local community with respect to this. And I think it's down to, we're, we're very lucky with the people who manage that, because they have, and they are, I think, have an understanding of the Egyptian travelling community, and have got very long links with that community, and s seem to manage it very well. So really, overall, and, and maybe it just, maybe it's unique, but certainly the, the, the experience we've had is a very positive experience and there's not been any real issues, you know, that, that maybe, in saying that there's been some things from time to time, but nothing, you know, that's ongoing, that nothing that's uh, a big issue within the community. And do you see that as something that, that could perhaps be expanded across the country um, with, with careful management? Well, I think it's horses for courses and I, as I mentioned earlier on, you know, the type of you know, um, sort of accommodation type of accommodation we look for on the borders that is it seems to be passing through more type of accommodation where, where I think maybe elsewhere you've got, uh, you know, people looking for settled accommodation uh, in a longer term process. And I think it's maybe different in these things, but I do think there may be lessons that could be learned, be learned from that. But it's all about, I think, sensitivity of management and uh, and, and effective mediation. Certainly, Dennis. Uh, just, just on that point, Mr Scott, um, you, you've mentioned a couple of times anyway, the Equality Act. Do you think that uh, that would apply to commercial site owners in terms of uh, the mobile homes that they have and they've got sites? Do you think that um, there is some engagement should be had with maybe commercial sites um, to enable gypsy travellers to start using that type of facility? I think it's more... I think, um, there's a need for um, maybe more of a awareness, mediation, etc., discussion with uh, commercial site owners. Uh, I think you know. I, I think um, legislation. I think it's more winning hearts and minds, uh, you know, and, and and talking through it with uh, the owners. The owners. Basically, you're saying although there's an act, there could be discrimination, and it's. I'm not suggesting you're. You're saying it's okay, 
but you're saying it's about um, uh, getting people to acknowledge the cultural difference and uh, maybe, as you say, engage to see if uh, there's a, a practical possibility then of maybe using commercial sites more readily. Very much so. I, th I, mean, I think, I think the, 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 there's commercial sites throughout Scotland and I think we've got to look at that possibility. And um, certainly we've sort of have gone down the road of surveying the various commercial sites. If someone goes into a site and they pull up, whether it be in a, 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 a traveller home or whatever, um, the, the, basically if they pay their fee, they're allowed to get on. Mm -hmm. But if you're a gypsy traveller, you might not um, be admitted. Would that well, be correct? Well, I don't, it depends. I, I don't know. I don't know. It's, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's it's up to the private owner, I suppose, to take a, to do what they have to do. All, all what I'm saying is that there's a need for an education and awareness. Uh, I think we've got we've got to explore that route uh, as well as taking uh, other types of um, sort of uh, action. And, and, and finally, um, and, and this question is, is for Ms McPhail, um, you said earlier that gypsy travellers are, are seen as part of your client group and are well integrated. And, I, and as I said earlier, I visited Loch Gilphead. All, all committee have, have been to visit a number of sites. And, and certainly the, the view of the gypsy travellers that we have spoken to, they don't see themselves as part of your client group and they don't see themselves as well integrated in the community. And, and I do wonder, um, if they are part of the client group, the length of time gypsy travellers have to, to wait to get um, adaptations, modifications, improvements done to the site, do you think that's acceptable if they are part of the client group? It's interesting that you, you say that they feel at Look Outpaid very disenfranchised. And did they give any kind of details of specifics and what made them feel like that? I think the, the, the poor condition of the site, the lack of access, the um, <coughs> lack of access to public transport, the access road to the site, the poor conditions on the site. And, and I'm, I, I don't particularly mean to single you out because those views were expressed by gypsy travellers across the sites that we saw. But, but I, I did want to specifically <coughs> ask you, as you said, they were seen as part of your client group. Absolutely the case, and if what the folks are telling you, we need to address that, and we need to go and speak to the travellers and get to the root of what they see as the issues and deal with them, mm -hmm. and we will do that. Okay, thank you very much for that, um, Ms. McPhail. Do any of the other committee members have any further questions for the the witnesses this morning? Well, can I thank you very much for coming along this morning and giving us um, your evidence? It's been a very useful session and will certainly help us in taking this piece of work forward. So thank you for doing that. Um, I'll now suspend the meeting until 10.45. Thank you.
Agenda item two this morning is consideration of the European Commission work programme for 2013 and paper two sets out the background to the committee's EU scrutiny work and proposes engagement and scrutiny priorities. And this morning we're being invited to note the briefing set out in the annex and to adopt the Commission recommendation on fostering implementation of the National Roma Integration Strategy as a continuing priority for EU scrutiny to be reported back to the EERC and to agree to continue taking the UK national strategy into account in the context of our inquiry on issues affecting gypsy traveller people. Do committee members have any comments or are we content to agree those recommendations? John. Can I brief comment? Uh, uh, first of all, it's to, to thank the clerk for um, com compiling this and, and to stress that I think the importance of the Roma situation. There are, if people are aware, there are a number of unfortunate incidents across Europe. I, I have written to the Mayor of Belgrade regarding a sizeable uh, relocation of the Roma population there. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I think linking in with our previous discussions, it's very important that we keep a wider uh, eye on, on developments and, and hope to improve the situation locally and uh, across with our uh, international partners too. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, John. Dennis, would you want to come no, in? I'm on that just content, actually. Any members have any other comments? Are we content to agree the recommendations that are in the paper? Thank you very much for that. Um, that concludes our formal meeting this morning. Our next meeting will take place on Monday the 4th of February in Aberdeen and will include oral evidence from gypsy travellers, local authorities and local police and health services on where gypsy travellers live. Thank you.